ideas are perhaps the most powerful thing that we have as humans. It was Victor Hugo, the French author of Les Miserables and other great works who said that nothing is more powerful than an idea whose time has come. There's a similar line, which is that the pen is more powerful than the sword, which uh, someone quibbed can only be said by someone who wasn't stabbed by either of them. But ideas truly are powerful, powerful things. And I think that in the realm of ideas, perhaps what may be the most powerful of ideas is the idea of the mystical, the idea of mysticism. The problem with the idea of mysticism is that few people really understand what it means. And it's surrounded by a lot of confusion, which stops it from being perhaps the powerful idea that it could be. And what I'd like to try and do tonight with you is to unpack what this word may mean from a philosophical and universal sense, so we could see what power it may hold for us, how it may transform us, and how it may transform the world as a result as well, through the lens of Judaism and philosophy and all kinds of good things, and then try to apply that to the 21st century, to these situations that we find ourselves living in. Back in 1899, William Ralph Ng wrote that no word in our language has been employed more loosely than mysticism. And Gershon Shalom, the famous scholar of Jewish mysticism, said that there are as many definitions for mysticism as there are scholars of mysticism giving definitions. And in common usage, mysticism has come to mean something which is nebulous, occult, supernatural, obtruse, dark, enigmatic, hidden, incomprehensible, unfathomable, unknown. The mystical is a word with a wide range of semantic meaning, and most of them are not positive. People typically think about it as some sort of just confused thinking or some sort of spiritualism, hypnotism, occultism, magic. And we don't necessarily have the time to do this, but usually when I give an introductory class to mysticism, I like to go around the room and ask people, what, what does this word conjure to them in one word or in one sentence? And the variety of connotations that come forth from the people that are joining us usually are wildly varied and there seems to be little coherence that connects all of these definitions. So I think therefore that we need to try and use this word as precisely as possible to try and make sen some sense of it and understand what it may hold behind it in behind this mysterious word. So let us try to put aside from our mind any connotations, any associations that we have with the esoteric, with the supernatural, with the dark arts, with the unknown. Let us try to push aside any of those definitions and let us try focus simply on three definitions that I'd like to offer towards and we're going to see how those three definitions work together. Does that sound good? Good. Fantastic. Okay. I want to start with a very beautiful poetic definition and then we'll move to some more technical definitions. This is perhaps my favorite poetic definition. It comes from a great Anglican scholar, a woman by the name of Evelyn Underhill, who wrote a real classic on mysticism. She wrote, and she, this quote varies in different times that she uses it, but her favorite usage of this quote is when she writes of, of mine is that mysticism, and listen very carefully, mysticism is the art of a union with reality. Sometimes she calls it the science of you, but in this case, it's the art of a union with reality. And let's, let's break that down a little. Firstly, in this case, when she uses the quote, it's an art. It's a, there's something artful about it. There's, it's not an exact science. It's not a methodology. It's an art. And the art is of union with reality. Evelyn is a Christian scholar, and she writes reality with a capital R, referring to the divine reality. Sometimes she'll write union with ultimate reality that we may be encountering a reality which may be illusory and we can get behind that to, to the real reality, the grounded being, and we'll speak about what that may mean in a second. But firstly, here in her definition, we see that mysticism is not about escapism. It's not about running away from things. It's about union with reality. A bit more of a technical and less poetic definition, which I think is gonna be very, very helpful. And for me has been an incredibly helpful tool, comes from a contemporary scholar of mysticism, Peter Moore, who's written some really incredible lucid analyses on mysticism in the Encyclopedia of Religion in the updated definition of mysticism. Peter Moore says that mysticism is comprised primarily of, th of three things, of unitive experiences, and I'll explain what these mean in a second, unitive theories and unitive practices, which means that we go through our ordinary day-to-day -day lives in a perception and experience of separation, of dualities, of boundaries and borders, of us and them, of me and here, this, this separation going on in our lives. And we think and we categorize by separating things. But there, there is a extraordinary experience 
in which those boundaries fall away. And this is not too uncommon of an experience. I think it's one in three Americans reports having something of a unit of mystical experience of this. And it comes in different forms. It may be visionary, it may be ecstatic, it may be contemplative and silent. It may be just a unit of state of consciousness where everything seems to meld, to blur into one another. Those are the experiences. And those can be precipitated by a variety of practices, which is his third category. And that can be through meditation, through contemplation, through prayer and worship, through solitude and silence, through chanting and reading, through dance, through breathing techniques, through fasting, diet, or psychedelics. These are all ways to come into that unit of experience. Then we have the theories that we try to build to understand what happened to us in those unit of moments. How does, how does that incredible experience, which is ranked by people who have the experience as one of the most influential and meaningful experiences of their, of their life, how does that make sense with our ordinary daily reality, which seems to be made up of multiplicity and, and different things and separation, and not everything seems to be one and united. That's the theory. And then there's the practice, which is the practices which lead us into that experience and the practice of how we live our lives going forward, having had that experience and that knowledge. The ethic, perhaps, of mysticism. There's a lot that we're trying to cover here very briefly, and I just want to sort of lay these ideas out here to put them out into your minds. And some of it may be, some for people that are more familiar with the field, this may be very basic. For people that this is all new, this may be a bit much, but we will come back to it. But let's, let us just lay out these definitions. I think they're incredibly helpful, concise, and precise definitions. I just want to add one slight, the third definition which I want to add is a little nuance in this, and this comes from another brilliant scholar, Bernard McGinn, who's in the middle of writing a complete history and encyclopedia veritably of Christian mysticism. Bernard McGinn writes that besides for this encounter, what he refers to as the human divine encounter, writing from a primarily Christian context, he says that everything that leads up to it and everything that flows from it, which would include all of the, the way of life that we practice that brings us into these experiences and the ways of life that we live from these experiences onwards is Bernard McGinn's adding a bit more of a, a process to, to this definition, which I, which I appreciate. And perhaps in, in a bit of more of a philosophical jargon, another great scholar, Annette Wilk, writes, these are the experiences in which boundaries and dualities are dissolved, primarily those of the subject and object, that the primary boundary for the philosophical mind is that there's a subject, there's the individual, my own subjectivity, and everything outside of me is the object. And according to philosophy, I can't even know if there's anything actually going on in other minds or in other, in other things outside of me. It may all just be an illusion, some sort of solipsistic vision. And Annette Wilk writes that in those moments, the boundaries between subject and object blur and disappear. And that happens either through a collapse of the subject that everything that I thought was me somehow gives way. This is an idea which we see very heavily emphasized in Buddhism, the idea that there is no real self, or it happens by the expansion of the subject, that everything that I see is part of my own identity. Everything that I see is only an extension of the divine self. So either by circling, either by widening our circle identity or by completely destroying it. And we'll, we'll speak more. This is all just footnotes to, to, to a very large subject. If I were to give a, a definition of mysticism, which may go across and cover a couple traditions and not be specifically about Judaism or specifically about Christianity or Buddhism, it may be something like the belief in the possibility of the encounter, presence, participation, union, communion, or identity with reality or with ultimate reality. The belief that, that the fundamental reality of nature is non-dual or fundamentally unified or interdependent or interconnected beyond all dichotomies of time and space, of subject and object, of good and evil, of language and logic, the belief that this identity and truth cannot be communicated, namely it is ineffable, and it cannot be discovered discursively, but only through a direct experience of awakening of consciousness to this reality, through a transformative process, which may incorporate a variety of practices, techniques, rituals, or disciplines, a process, and I think this is an important part, a process by which the sense of separate self is lost, and the unitive, the absolute instead is found, a process which ideally and naturally leads to an increased sense and feeling of bliss and acceptance, selflessness, love, and compassion, and we'll speak about why that is the case. Mysticism has typically found its manifestation in, in, in religion, and generally when we speak about religion and mysticism, we can divide religions into what's known as their esoteric and their exoteric, the way in which they're practiced on the outside, their general theology and practice, and then on the inside, the mystic heart inside religion. 
And this is something which we see across world traditions. And I think that by looking at the outside of the thing, we're going to see a lot of separation. But by looking to the inner, to the heart of the thing, we're going to begin to see a lot of themes of unity and see how really almost all the world's traditions are, I think, pointing to the shared reality that lies beneath them, to the great mystery of being. This metaphysics, this conception of reality, of encountering the absolute which is united, this, dis this dissolution of the self, the self which keeps us separate from one another, a metaphysics of interconnectivity, of interbeing and co-creation, I think is not just a metaphysics for mystics and religious people, but I think in the contemporary age, we're beginning to see that this conception of reality has also been embraced by some leading thinkers, scientists. I just want to give you one quote from a leading scientist of the past century, and then I will tell you who the quote is from. The quote runs like this, and I think this is a really beautiful encapsulation of the vision of reality of the mystic holds. And the mystic, we shouldn't think of some other person. The mystic is all of us in potential. The quote begins like this. A human being is a part of the whole, called by us the universe, a part limited in time and space, or we may say space-time. We experience ourselves, our thoughts, and our feelings as something separate from the rest, a kind of optical delusion of our consciousness, writes this scientist. This delusion is a kind of prison for us, restricting us to our personal desires and to affections from a few persons nearest to us. Our task must be to free ourselves from this prison, to widen our circle of compassion, to embrace all living creatures and the whole of reality in its beauty. This notion of widening the concept of self until our identity stretches to beyond us to include the things around us. Nobody is able to achieve this completely, writes the scientist, but the striving for such achievements is itself part of the liberation and the foundation for inner security and, I might add, and peace. The name of the scientist will all be familiar to you. He was a German Jewish scientist by the name of Albert Einstein. This notion of escaping the, the optical delusion that we are separate from the rest of existence, seeing that we are part of an organic whole, is, I think, the secret of mysticism. And I think it's also the secret that the modern age is lacking, the this, this sense that we are not separate from the world outside of us, that there is one big organic unity, and it is part of her that we are one that we are part of that larger consciousness the larger being and this i think is the secret of mysticism which i would like to open explore and unpack what does this mean what does this notion this this change of perspective what i think is a paradigm shift what does it mean for religion what does it mean for life in general i think that there is perhaps an old way of doing religion an old way of doing life. And then there's on the other side of mysticism, there's a new way of doing religion and a new way of doing life. And this may be a little radical. We can talk about religion 1.0 and religion 2.0. And what happens between them is this paradigm shift. The way which we operated previously in religion and in life, we're going to see, is from a place of scarcity, from a place of limited resources, from a place of epistemological hubris where for me to be right, the other person had to be wrong. I had to disprove the Muslim or the Christian or the Hindu or the Buddhist for my own religion to be true. I had to persecute, the other one had to convert to my faith to show that I was, that I was right. Or in my own life, I had to try and coerce the people around me to be more religious so that I felt that I was doing the right thing, whether that be my children or my neighbors or my peers or my congregants or my rabbi, they all had to be, they had to be better because otherwise something was being spoken about my own that was lacking there. And the fundamental conception of this religion was one in where God was something which was outside of my reality. God was beyond, typically pictured as a monarchical fatherly figure who comes and punishes at times and rewards at times, but a character, an actor from outside of the system who impinges upon the system which God creates and runs. Religion 2.0, religion post-mysticism, says something entirely different. And I'm only talking about this semantically as something new, but really this has been there from the very beginning, where God, firstly, is not something which is outside the system. God is all that exists. If, if, every, if all of reality is only one, and that reality is the divine, then there is nothing but God. And this is the great message of the mystics, the great Jewish mystic from the 1800s. The Baal Shem Tov wrote in Od Milvado that alt is God and God is alt. There is nothing in existence that is not the divine. All is God and God is one. 
And it is in this conception where God is not outside the system, but God is inside, that God therefore is present in every manifestation inside that system, which means God is present in our own lives, in our ups and our downs, in our highs and our lows. God is present in our spirituality. And likewise, this conception of the divine, this conception of religion allows us to look to another co-religionist, to our neighbors who are not Jewish and see in their own practice something of beauty and something of divinity and something that can inspire us. This is a post-scarcity economics of religion where the truth and the beauty of another religion does not take away from our own relationship with our own religion, but in head, instead enhances it. And this, if this sounds like it's heretical and it sounds like it's some new age babble about religion, this is the, this is the visions of the prophets of Israel the prophet Isaiah says, that I will bring you, says the prophet Isaiah in the end of days, to my sacred mountain. You will rejoice in my house of prayer. Your offerings and your sacrifices will be accepted upon my altar. Why? Because my house shall be a house of prayer for all nations. The prophet Zephaniah Tzifanya says, Ki az al amim look from kulam b'shem Hashem b'shem echad, that then I will restore a pure lip, a new way of speaking to the people, that they may all call out in the name of God and serve God as one shoulder to shoulder. This vision that we can serve the divine together is based on a new conception of reality, where the divine is no longer outside. If the divine was outside and beyond us, and we were all fighting to get to the divine, and only one of us could get there in the right way, then it would make sense to compete and for to, to, to battle things out. But if, the, but if the divine is ever present, if the divine is present in every moment of inspiration, then we can find the divine in the prayer of the Hasidic Jew, in the, in the swirling of the Sufi, in the, in the meditation of the Buddhist, the divine is present in all those things. And this is the vision, I believe, of the prophets of Israel. That is what it may mean for religion. And that, as you can imagine, is a bit of a radical shift in religion. What it may mean for life may be even more radical. And, and this, is, this is where things start getting quite beautiful, I think. If we live in a conception of reality where things are fundamentally separate from one another in the non-mystical, let's say, then if I encounter another person, my first assumption evolutionarily is that they are a threat. They're a threat to my own resources. They're a threat to my person. I can be jealous about their achievements. I can be competitive with them. And we try to build our economics on principles of, of non-harm. How do we, how do we stop each other from hurting each other? These are the great political theories of Hobbes and Hume, or we try to build our economics on these on, on game theory where we can try and see how can we all be rational actors working in our best self-interest in ways that don't impinge upon the other. This is what modern political and economic theory is built on. But what if we change our metaphysics? What if we change our conception of reality towards what may be in fact a scientifically and metaphysically accurate view of reality, where we are not separate from one another, but we are coexistent in one large divine organism, then we move from jealousy and competition and we move to love and to collaboration. We see the other as a participation, as an extension of the self. And just like my own best self-interest is in the furthering of my own aims and desires and hopes, so too the furthering of the interests of what I perceive to be other than me is in my own best interest. The same way that a mother for a child only wants the best for their child, only wants them to flourish. And it doesn't take away from their own success if their child is flourishing, quite to the contrary. The Talmud says, Bakal adam chutz me bno talmido, that a person is jealous naturally of everyone besides for their own child and student. But if we viewed all of reality as students and as our own children and siblings, then we will be able to have jealousy for none and love for all. There's a great expression in Yiddish that le fargen is how it's been translated into, into, into Hebrew, to fargin, to, to, to really to be happy for someone else's success. Um, there's, there's a beautiful expression when someone, when someone does a favor and they say, thank you, you say, with the greatest of pleasure that I was able to do something for you. So we can move from economics of jealousy to economics of fargin That may be what this metaphysical shift may afford us. For the Kabbalists, all of Judaism, every single moment of Judaism was structured so that we could participate in this unit of reality. The Kabbalists believe that we saw the world in one of separation naturally, as we've been saying, because of the products 
of the Tsimtsum and all complex metaphysical ideas, which we can speak about in a minute. But they believe that we be that we lived in an illusion in Ha'alem, where we saw a world of separation in Alma de Pruda. And the Kabbalists believed that we saw a world of separation because we had a contraction of consciousness. Our minds were made small in what they call katno tamochen. There's a contracted consciousness. And the Kabbalists wanted to teach us a way that we can move to an expanded consciousness. And we'll speak very briefly about how they wanted to do that for us. And from that place of expanded consciousness, we no longer see a world of separation in Amal de Prada. We see a world of unity in Amal de Yehuda. And for the Kabbalist, for the mystic who experienced this expanded consciousness and this expanded metaphysics in Amal de Yehuda, the beauty of their vision, I believe, compelled them to share it with others so that they could see it too. For the Kabbalists, every single mitzvah, every single one of the 613 commandments that we do, were not simply a way that we could serve God or worship God or be obedient to God. For the Kabbalists, the mitzvot were a way of uniting with God. The Kabbalists, before every mitzvah, would say, L'shem yichud kuchabrichu shchente liachada, that the mitzvah that I'm doing now is to unite the divine masculine and the divine feminine, which they believe themselves to be a part of. The world itself, the human, is the feminine, which was uniting with the divine masculine. The mitzvah, in the etymology of the word, does not mean commandment. We have other words for commandments in Hebrew. Mitzvah means connection. Tzav is the etymology of mitzvah, that every mitzvah is a chance to connect to God. And the Kabbalist said something really, really radical. If I said this myself, I would be thrown right out of the Orthodox community, but it's the Kabbalist that said this. They said, quoting the prophet Isaiah again, that it is only your sins that separate you from God, which means that if we remove our sin, if we remove our faulty perception of reality, if we remove these things that aren't allowing us to naturally connect with the divine, then there will be nothing which separates us between us and God, and we become one with God. This is what the Kabbalists say, that naturally we are there already connected, one unified with God in our innocence, in our purity. It is only our own choices that keep us separate from that reality. And the question of why we separate ourselves is a great question. And this, I believe, is part of the messianic vision of the Kabbalists. This may be all a lot to take in. So I'm gonna, we're going to take a brief pause after we make this point. I think we're about at a halfway mark here. That this vision of reality is what the Kabbalists call the idea of Mashiach. Again, we spoke before about a separation between the esoteric and the exoteric, between the external form of religion and the inner heart of religion. According to an exoteric conception of religion, there is an exoteric idea of messianism. It's a political figure who comes to redeem the Jews from under their suffering. At the, you know, at the time of formulation, there was a Roman occupation here in the land of Israel, and the Jews needed to be redeemed from that, and they wanted a messianic figure in the shape of King David to return to fight off their enemies. And this is an exoteric vision of messianism. The inner vision of messianism, says the Kabbalists, is not a political figure who comes riding on a donkey to save us from our enemies. This is all religion 1.0. This is all pre-paradigm shift religion. The messianic figure for the Kabbalists was a state of consciousness that we embodied, a state of consciousness of unity, the unity that we've been describing up until now, the Kabbalists describe as the messianic consciousness, as the Adamic consciousness before the fall, before the sin in Eden. And when enough people says the Kabbalists, embrace this consciousness that creates a tipping point, a ripple effect that all of the world is, is consumed in this consciousness of unity. A very beautiful Kabbalistic reading of a verse from the Song of Songs, of the Song of Solomons in chapter two, which the verse says, that behold the lover, the divine, the Messiah, as the Kabbalists read it, stands behind our walls, gazing through the windows, peering through the lattices, waiting to break into our reality. And the Kabbalists point out something very beautiful in this verse here, that it does not say that this, this entity, this consciousness, this figure is standing behind the wall. It is standing behind our wall, which means that we put up our own walls that hold out the divine consciousness. And that all we need to do is to bring down our own walls, is to have the, the internal security, the internal trust that if we bring down our walls, what will flow in will be the beautiful and the unitive and the divine. And this is part of the messianic vision. I just want to share a very short story from, from a, a very great mystic who was 
uh, the greatest religious influence in my life and continues to be till today. Um, and, and, and what they mean and, and sort of use his example as a paradigm for religion uh, and then end off with a nice idea and quote, and then we will open up to some questions. I see that Anne had a question and I would love to come back and hear your questions. The, an embodied example of this way of operating, what it actually may mean in reality, there, there was a very influential mystic who lived in Brooklyn during the century, the Lubavitcher Rabbi, Rabbi Menachem Mendel Schneerson, who to myself has been my own spiritual mentor and guide and continues to be so. Um, and the, the Rebbe was an incredibly busy person who, who ran a very large empire and operation of kindness and love, reaching out to Jews all over the world, hunting Jews down with kindness in the language of Jonathan Sachs, the same way that the Nazis had hunted us down with hatred. That was the, the Rebbe's mission. And because of the Rebbe's mission, the Rebbe was an incredibly sought after person, incredibly busy with an incredibly tight schedule. And people came to the Rebbe for blessings, for advice, for guidance, for, for, for spiritual counsel, for all kinds of things. And there was one fellow, I'm not sure his name, he came to, he wanted to have a chat, he wanted to talk and ask the Rebbe something. But every time he tried to get a moment with the Rebbe, the, the crowds were so busy and, and there were so many people that he barely got a second and he was, he, was, he was shoved out of the way and he kept trying, but he was never able to get a moment with, with the Rebbe. And someone told him that if you wait in front of the Rebbe's house on President Street, as the Rebbe leaves, his home in the morning, you may be able to catch a moment with him. And this is a really beautiful story. So the person does it. He wakes up early in the morning, like I've woken up early for this Zoom, and he goes out to meet the rabbi at the bottom of his stairs. And he catches the rabbi when the rabbi is alone, and he's able to have a few precious minutes with the rabbi. And he feels like the rabbi was there for him and heard him and, and, and held him. And as soon as the rabbi continues to walk, there were a few young Chabad boys, Bahram as we call them, who saw this interaction and they were furious. They were furious that this person cut the line, that he skipped ahead and that he, he stole minutes of the Rebbe's time, precious, precious minutes. And they came over to him and they, they gave him a real telling off saying, how dare you take the Rebbe's time? Do you have any idea how busy the Rebbe is? How many thousands of people around the world are, are waiting on his advice? Do you think that you are more important than them, that you took the Rebbe's? And this person was made to feel terrible. And he, he, he really felt bad. And he wrote a very remorseful letter to the Rebbe saying about how he didn't understand the Rebbe's schedule and he feels so bad. He should have spoken less and this and that, a whole, very remorseful letter. And I'm not sure what the Rebbe's letter in response to him was, but the Rebbe wrote a letter to the faculty of the yeshiva where these young men were studying, where these young Bachram were studying. And the Rebbe wrote three things. And the third one is the point which I want to get to, but the first two are, are, are sort of the opening, the opening volley that leads to the third. The Rebbe said, firstly, why do these young men, why do these young Bachram feel that they're they're, they've been appointed to manage my time and my calendar? They're not my secretaries. I have people that are doing that. Secondly, at that time in the morning, why were they out on President Street when they should have been in Yeshiva learning Gemara? Number two. Number three is... The Rebbe said like this, and this is the point which I'm trying to get to. The Rebbe said that we, Hasidim, we are spiritual heirs of the Baal Shem Tov. The Baal Shem Tov taught that a soul, the founder of the Hasidic movement in, in Eastern Europe, 18th century, the Baal Shem Tov taught amongst many teachings, a great mystic, that a soul comes down to this world for 70 or 80 years, perhaps for the single moment to do one favor for a fellow human being. And the Rebbe says, how do these Bachram know that this one Jew who needed my attention and needed my love, maybe that was the entire purpose that my soul came down to this world for 70 or 80 years, just to do one kindness to this one Jew. Why would they want to deprive me of that opportunity, of my opportunity of a lifetime? What my soul, the, my, my soul's, purpose and mission rectification. Which means to say that the Bachram saw that there was a whole empire of kindness and love and compassion and Torah and, and connection. But this one moment, said the rabbi, may have been the entire purpose of all of it. What's interesting here to think about this critically for a second is that if you do a cost-benefit analysis, these young students may have actually been right that the Rebbe's time would actually should, should have been spent better 
in other ways, perhaps, that if you do sort of a, a SWOT analysis, this was not the best way that the Rebbe spent his time. But the Rebbe's point is that from these new metaphysics, we do not make cost-benefit analysis when it comes to souls, because souls are absolute. And every moment is a moment of the absolute. And the analysis that we make from that perspective is an entirely different one. It's a utopian analysis. It's a messianic analysis. And the beauty of the Rebbe's vision was uniting a utopian vision with a pragmatic mission of living our lives. The question is, the question is, or a question that I have is, how do we, how do we get from that experience, from that, from that moment of unity, which is, which is experiential for humans, there's something empirical about it. How do we get from there to our everyday lives? How do we, how do we bridge that gap between them? Because there seems to be quite a distance. I came across a beautiful line from, from Salman Rushdie, a bit of a controversial author who wrote, that the visionary or mystical experience does not last very long. And that's true, it's transient, it comes and goes. It's a, it's a peak, it's not a plateau. He says it is for art to capture that experience. In his case, literature, was the, he did it. But there are many ways that we can express our art. He says that it is for art to offer to us a secular materialist culture, some sort of replacement for what the love of God offered in a time of faith, paraphrasing Rushdie. That there is something that we can do in our language. Language, wrote Rushdie, is courage. It's the ability to conceive a thought, to speak it, and by doing so, to make it true. When we take these experiences, and we embody them, and we communicate them, and we write about them, and we create art about them, and we educate ourselves and others about them, we're able to extend those experiences. Art, said Dostoevsky, is, have, is the feeling that the artist feels transferred to those experiencing the art. There is a feeling here, there's a feeling of unity, and it is the work that we need to do as artists, as thinkers, to take that, to take that poetry and to bring it to other people so they can feel it too, and they can be moved into that experience. We live in a world, and this is particularly true of the present moment, and this is unfortunately true of many moments preceding up to it, we live in a world which is burning, a world which is full of crisis and alienation. And I don't, I don't want to dwell on that, but that's, we all know it to be true and to be the case. And that is only exacerbated by media and technology. We live in the language of Bereshit Rabbah in a house on fire. Bereshit Rabbah speaks about the individual who's walking down the street, going from place to place, and he sees a castle that's burning. And he, he shouts and he says, where is the, where is the owner that is, where, who's, who's putting out the fire? Where's the owner of this house? And the owner steps out from the castle itself that's on fire and says, I am the owner of this house. Come and extinguish it with me. God is not outside the burning building. God is inside our pain. God is inside our suffering and alienation. And God beckons to us to come and build, to come and create, to come and heal the world with us, to come and put out those fires, the fires that are created by alienation and jealousy and separation, to bring instead the waters of unity, the waters of love and compassion. God, we believe, does not create anything in this world for no purpose. And the existence of technology, like the existence of gold that was created, says the Medrash, only for the purpose of being used in the temple and the Mishkan, the existence of technology, of the internet, of TikTok and Zoom and YouTube and Facebook, are all there for one purpose, to promote peace and unity and harmony, to promote a messianic consciousness. And therefore, we can use those things. And the Rebbe led by example, the Rebbe was the first Hasidic leader to fuse technology with spirituality, to fuse the two together, to share his teachings, his message over radio, over TV. And it is in vain of the Rebbe's prophetic inspiration that we continue to do so by sharing these messages over YouTube and over Facebook and over Twitter and over Instagram and TikTok. And these are tools that can be used for positive as much as they may be used for negative. And that is what we're trying to do at the channel that Duffy mentioned earlier in the beginning. To end with one final thought, and then we'll open up again for questions. I want to end with two quotes, one from the American anthropologist, Margaret Mead, who said, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has and to end with a quote from the author that we started, Victor Hugo, he said, there is nothing like a dream to create the future. Utopia today, flesh and blood tomorrow. Thank you, everyone, for joining us.
Thank you, Zevi. Um, I wonder if you could perhaps just talk a little bit about your channel and your work uh, that you're doing now, um, just for those who are not familiar so much with your work. Sure, sure, certainly. So it's a bit of a, a strange story how I got to making the channel. I, I grew up in the Hasidic community, in a, which is the, the mysticism of, of Hasidism still runs very deeply in my blood. At some point along my studies, I encountered the mysticism of other traditions, and they spoke to me with great beauty and, and depth. Um, and I, I wanted to find a way to pursue that exploration in a way that would be helpful both to um, my own living and somehow share that vision with others. And my initial thought was perhaps to do it academically, to go into the study of com comparative mysticism. And, and that was a thought for some time. For whatever reason, I, I chose instead to go another route and see if I could perhaps go straight from the books, straight from the academia and straight to the public and skip out the, the middleman process. And I, I had some academic advisors and professors who, who encouraged me to do so um, and some friends who encouraged me to do so. And I, I really didn't know what I was doing when I started. I started just with a, a book review, um, a great book from William Stace, Philosophy and Mysticism. And very quickly, people um, seem to appreciate the, the the message the the the, the positivity the hope and the rigorousness and, and and sort of the academic um thoughtfulness not just not just speaking about ideas in the abstract but, but really grounding them in 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 research and in the scholarship my background was first was teaching in person and and i still do love teaching in person and and teaching uh technologically is is, is a far second to that um but i've had the great the great great benefit of being able to create content online video content since the beginning of COVID about once a week and on a range of topics relating to history and philosophy of mysticism of all traditions um, with a perhaps with focus on Jewish mysticism which is my own home but using that as a as a portal to go outwards and and really what underlies all of the research and all of the production is this vision of reality and finding ways that that can be expressed and how it has been expressed throughout history um, so that, that is one component is, is classes that we give on a variety of subjects. We've probably done something like 40 or 50 uh, very serious uh, full length classes and, and series over at the channel on, on a variety of subjects and thinkers. As well, we bring on different experts from different fields, authors, professors, poets, practitioners um, to come and share their wisdom with the audience. The very first interview we had was with a brilliant professor of Sufism here in Israel by the name of Sarah Sfiri, um, who besides her being a brilliant mind and, and really understanding the, the history of Sufism in a, in a phenomenal way, she really lives it. And, and it was really flowing from her heart. And I remember Sarah Sfiri, she was telling me that, Zevi, stop with the philosophy, stop with the books and the academia, get into the heart. It's a, it's, this is the wisdom of the heart, Chachmat Aleva, she put it. That was uh, Sarah Sfiri, a beautiful interview. Uh, Alyssa Siegel, who's here with us, um, has been incredibly instrumental in making this project happen. And Alyssa was there with me filming Sarah Sfiri. I believe that was Alyssa who actually found Sarah Sfiri through a, through a connection of hers. So thank you, Alyssa, for, for, the, for the brilliant work that you've been doing helping making that project a reality. And along, along the way, we've, we've encountered all kinds of wonderful people. Uh, a, a recent project that we started on the channel is to go to every single religious minority in Israel and befriend them and uh, get to know them and interview them and share time with them. And we've done that with the Ahmadiyya community, the Baha'i, the Druze. Um, just yesterday, I, I was on the phone for some time with Imad from the Ahmadiyya community, a really fascinating Muslim sect uh, up in Haifa, um, and really making friends around the country and then sharing those friends and friendships with the world and, and, and showing people that, that there really is a way of getting to know our neighbors, not as enemies and as threats and as, as terrorists, but we can get to know them as friends and as, as, as lovers and as people that are serving God together with us. Um, and that's, that's really part of the vision that, that runs everything behind the channel. And um, thank God, thank God. It's been, it's been an incredible journey, um, incredible, incredible amounts of time and effort um, on behalf of people like Alyssa and others that go into making it happen. But um, it's really been a beautiful opportunity to use technology to create community, to create positivity, to create, un to create a sense of unity when technology is so often used, unfortunately, for the opposite, to show that it can be used positively. Um, and there is a challenging, there, there is an additional meditation we could speak about here about the, the place of the, the place of community building online in the 21st century and, and, and how one does that uh, as aspiring mystics. Um, but maybe I'll, I'll open up to some questions. And I'll see where people's, where, where people, 
where people's minds and hearts are at. Yes, perfect. Thank you so much. Um, so uh, as we are opening up to uh, questions and answers, I will post the link to uh, Zevi's channel on the chat. It's Seekers of Unity on uh, YouTube, but you can also find it in other forms online, I believe, uh, in podcast channels. Is that right, Zevi? Okay. Yes. Yes, and so true. by so when you're done here today if this if you're not already a subscriber of uh, Zevi's channel please go online and find look look him up and uh, by all means you know check out the content uh, and subscribe if you will support his work it's it's really wonderful one of a kind work um, and and uh, yeah uh, we'll take a take some questions if we can I know that Anne had a question. Um, thank you, Zevi. Um, that was a blast. Um, uh, I guess I've been reading about the, I hope this is not a, this is a distraction, but I've been reading about the unifications of the Kabbalists, how they were always trying to bring together these principles of male and female in everything they did. And the idea of God and the Shekhinah, but on earth it's male and female. And, and I just wondered if you could say something about that. Um, I'm a poet myself. I write poetry in ancient Hebrew and always I'm trying to bring equality to the voices of men and women, men and women all the time. Um, that's my own view on it. So I'd love to hear your view. Thank you, Anne. That's a that's a beautiful question, and it's a it's a, it's an honor to be here in the presence of of poets and and and, and mystics like yourself. <laughs> so, to describe the entire capitalistic system as a sexualized metaphor for the union of the human and the divine, the spiritual and the material through the lenses of the masculine and feminine, would not be an incorrect understatement. The capitalist's entire system is predicated on one specific book in the Bible, we could say perhaps, which is the song of songs that you quoted from earlier, Shir Hashirim, which as a poet of, of, of ancient Hebrew, uh, I, I'm, I'm sure you're aware of. The, the, the song of songs goes on to become really the, the Bible for the capitalists because the love story between the masculine and feminine is what rides through that story. And the Kabbalists read it as earlier Jewish thinkers and authors had read it before them as a metaphor for the relationship between God and the human. To say this very briefly, and this, this is really a, a large topic that we're opening here, the Kabbalists conceived of God in two different ways. There was God in God's hiddenness, God is the Ein Sof, which was completely simple, transcendent, ineffable, and nothing could be said of it. And there was God as God expressed God's self through the Sfirot. And the Sfirot manifest as masculine and feminine. The Sfirot, which are 10 in total, are broken up into three channels. The right is the masculine, the left is the feminine, and the middle is where those two come together. So we have Chachma, the masculine, we have Bina, the feminine, we have Dat, where the two of them merge and come into union. And when they come together, they give birth to the next set, which is Chesed, Guvra, which come together for Tiferet. And then there's Netzach, the masculine, Hod, feminine, which come together in Yesod and ultimately produce Malchut, reality as we know it. So the, the entire system of the Kabbalists, as we said, was to unite these two sides of the divine, typified by Adam and Eve, the, the masculine, the feminine, Kuchabruchu and Shechina, as Anne mentioned. And it is through the, through the acts of kindness, through the acts of the mitzvot, that we're able to create that union, to come back to our primordial union. And it is that union which is co-created, which is procreated, which brings reality into existence. There's, there's an interesting parallel, perhaps, between the two hemispheres of the brain, the right and left brain. When they work in synergy together, we create our own reality, our own perceptions born from our own internal masculine and feminine. And ju just to make a small point here, masculine and feminine does not mean male and female. Masculine and feminine is present in what in, in, in biological males and biological females. This is these are these are archetypes, these are spiritual ideas, not biological ones, just to just to clarify that point there. The masculine and feminine produce something very interesting for the Kabbalists, which is they produce a 
a higher union that we spoke about before. We spoke about Adam and Eve, the masculine and feminine, the original archetypes being separated when they're back to back and coming together face to face. A very, and I, I just want to throw this out there as an idea, and and we'll have to elaborate on it another time. <laughs> but the, the the final notion of the Kabbalistic system is that the ultimate creation of the Kabbalist, the ultimate creation of the divine spherotic system, is the sphera of Malchut. Malchut is seen as the feminine, and the purpose of creation is that the feminine rises up to the level of Keter, and from there it re-emanates in order of creation again. The notion is that that Chachma gives just the seed, just the idea to Bina, and Bina expands that, and that is the process, the biological process between the masculine and feminine, between the male and female, rather, where the male gives the seed to the woman, and the woman expands that into a living being. And what happens in Bina, according to the cat, what happens in Bina, the upper mother, and what happens in Malchut, is the expansion of this. There's a very enigmatic passage in the, in the Kabbalists, that um, that just like a teacher, there's a, a Mishnah which the Kabbalists read that one says that I learned a lot from my teachers, I learned more from my peers, but I learned most from my students. The Talmud, the student, the recipient, the mass, the, the feminine is the recipient according to the Kabbalists, is the one that gives back to the giver more than the giver could have ever given. The idea of Halaat Malchut, the the ascension of Malchut, is really a, a very a very very um, incredible idea that even even borders on, on ideas of heresy sometimes, because if we are in, in, in the divine human relationship, we are the feminine, God is the masculine. And if we speak about the, the mass, the feminine being that which rises above the masculine, that is, that, is in, that is the feminine which comes and gives back to the masculine more than it could have ever had at the beginning. If we understand that in terms of the relationship of the human divine, we're, we're opening up some very interesting heretical angles that the Kabbalists open up for us to explore. And I'm going to leave it at that. I like that. Thank you. Good. You're welcome. So, yeah, in the last um, uh, time that you've been, uh, in this moment that you've been talking and sharing this grander vision of religion, like you say, religion 1.0, religion 2.0, and you mention um, how that post-paradigm shift view of reality um, was there all along. Can you just elaborate just a little bit by what you mean. It was there all along, but there's this paradigm shift. So just yes, talk a yes, bit. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. So that's a great question because it does seem to be a bit of an oxymoron to say that it is a paradigm shift, but it was there all along. I think, I think the real answer is that it's a paradigm shift that has been taking place all along. And, and what I mean by that is, is that the, the natural state of... The true state, let's, let's differentiate between the natural and the true, if we can do that for a second. The true state of our consciousness is this unit of consciousness. Uh, I, I, I believe that to be, to be the case. And, I, and I, think, I think that's evident from what we're learning from, from our own um, neuroscience and other fields seem to point to that direction. That, that, this is, that we learn to put up walls in life, that we don't, we're not naturally born with walls. But I think what, what naturally happens is that we do come to see distinction and separation. And, and, and there is a role for that. There is a role for a certain point in our development to have a conception of self, which, which is singular and which is protected. And, and, and I think there is a point in our own development where we need to understand that to keep ourselves safe, safe from, from predators and from, from cars rolling down the street. But then we can sort of hopefully move beyond that. And I think that the same happens historically. The same happens in religion, where I think that religions, and, and this is a very contested point when it comes to the history of religions, nobody is studying religion academically will know, but one theory of the origins of religion is that the origins of religion begins with a great, what we call today a great founding and prophet, prophetic figure who comes and teaches some new message to the world. For those that are adherents to the theories of mysticism, they believe that the prophet is a type of mystic. It's a mystic with a very strong ethical uh, demand and what differentiates the prophet and the mystic is a great question in the scholarship as well. But the the assumption that I operate with is that the these the founding characters of all religions are people that have had the mystical unit of experience of the divine, and therefore it's a paradigm shift which is there all along because the very foundations of the religion are there to to try and communicate this ineffable experience of the union with the divine to the masses. I, just to give some examples from Judaism, I believe that it's 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 
It's Moses who encounters the divine at the burning bush, who returns to that place when he takes his people out of slavery. He comes back to the very same spot on Chorev on Sinai, and the people there encounter the divine in a unitive moment. They stand by the mountain, like one person with one heart, united in what in, in these words here are coded to hint to us that there's a mystical experience going on. They're experiencing a singular consciousness, a singular heart. And it's in that moment where they hear the divine Anochi, they hear the eye of the cosmos come forth. It's the prophets of later Israel who get caught up in their mystic rapture, who come back and are they're called Mishugayim, they're called crazy people because they're babbling about their experiences. And the only coherent thing they can say is, how can you oppress the stranger and the widow and the poor and the orphan? How can you? These people are your own flesh and blood. They are one with you. This is the message of the prophets. I believe that if we look at them as mystics, we begin to make sense of their babbling and make sense of their ethic. And I think this is true for, for the great founders. There's a, there's a very beautiful line from a, from a German Jewish philosopher who I particularly appreciate, Franz Rosenzweig, who wrote a book called The Star of Redemption. And he wrote that these encounters, these encounters with the divine, these unitive moments are the ABCs of religion. And he says, religion then throughout the ages tries to find ways to codify these experiences. How do you pass on a mystical experience? How do you pass on the ineffable? to your kin and to your brother and to your children. You create laws, you create codes, you create Ten Commandments, you create systems that try to make us live in line with those practices, with those experiences in ways that are ethical and right and conducive. But Rosenzweig says that sometimes after so many generations and millennia of these practices, we're so far from the ABC, we're so far from the beginning, from those moments of encounter that we that we spend all of our religious energy quibbling over the X, Y, Z of religion. And we forget that there even was an ABC. And Rosenzweig begs us to come back to the ABCs, to the encounter, to the anechia, to the, to, the, to the encounter with the divine, to the unity that stands at the core of religion. So I call this a paradigm shift that's always happened because this challenge is always there where that moment of inspiration comes back to the people. And then it is lost and it becomes ossified and calcified and needs to be broken again and again and again. And I think that throughout history, the great figures that have come to try and inspire us, to push us, to lead us towards a unit of consciousness, the Moses, the Aaron, the, the Abraham, the Baal Shem Tev, Isaac Luria in our own tradition, and many great saints and figures in other religions are there to try and bring back to this message, which stands at the, at the basis, the ABC of religion. So that that is what I might give as a attempted answer to Dovi's brilliant question. Uh, I was really struck by you calling the Moshech consciousness Edenic. Um, I read somewhere that because Adam and Chava were just in it uh, through their existence and then through our fall we've had to sort of work our way back and it is damn hard, isn't it, pulling down yes. those walls? It's yes. really hard work. That yes. um, that the that if we ever were to be able to achieve that oneness consciousness through our through our individual and collective work, that it would be a higher spiritual level, not just the Edenic consciousness. Yes. That yes. could be a distinction, I don't know. So I just yes. wondered what you thought about that because I'm hoping after many lifetimes of working this hard, <laughs> I might really get somewhere. <laughs> so I, I, I wish you, if I, was, if I was your Buddhist monk, I would wish you that this should be your last in, in, incarnation and you should, uh, you, should, <laughs> you should make it in this, in this round. Yes, yeah, so, so there's a very interesting point. Sue has picked up on, on what we said that the messianic consciousness is referred to by the Kabbalists as the Adamic consciousness. The uh, Adam the Adam pre pre sin sin is a bit of a, a tome that carries some Christian baggage, but but we'll try to put that aside for a second. There's a very there's a very beautiful and brilliant mystical reading of the fall, what what we refer to as the fall in the Garden of Eden, and and without getting into the particular and the details, the story of Adam in the Garden is the story of God in reality, God creating the world, and and in that experience. God has to come and know God's self. There is God in a sort of unconscious or unselfconscious state. And God in an encounter in the garden comes to learn of God's self. And this is a very elaborate idea amongst the mystics. And the notion is that, yes, where we come to after the fall from 
after after we correct what happened in the fall, we come to a higher state of unity than there was before. And the metaphor that the Kabbalists use to describe this is a metaphor from the biblical text itself, where Adam and Eve are created back to back, and they're separated so they can come together face to face. So we may be connected, we may be already one, but it's back to back. We're not aware of it. We don't see it. We're not, we don't perceive it. But when we go through a separation and we're able to work through, as Sue said many lifetimes, we can come back face to face. We can see each other and we can be reunited consciously and be aware of the unity that always was. Zevi, thank you so much for taking the time to, you know, as you said, wake up early in, uh, you know, in Israel and to attend this for your, uh, you know, is, oh, what a way to start the morning, Zevi. <laughs> yes. Yes, indeed. <laughs> Thank, thank you so much for uh, joining us today and for taking some, uh, you know, you're taking off your time to uh, present to us today. It was really, really good scholarship and the passion and the connection to activism. It's, it's, um, uh, and, and uh, you know, I noticed that you drew a lot on the Hasidic tradition and the Baal Shem Tov, and I think it kind of ties in to a rabbinic teaching about the Keser Shem Tov, that it's the crown of good name the, uh, however you might define it, the relationships that you maintain with people around you is the crown, it's the portion of, of wisdom and of the different wisdom traditions that is greater than all of the other contributions that our traditions offer us. So uh, much success in your continued work and uh, take care. Thank you, Derry. Catch you guys later.